Good afternoon. Welcome to our 4.30 p.m. session of the August 31st, 2021 special meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. Announcements and then we'll move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on today's agenda item, call in using the instructions on your screen. If you wish to comment on today's agenda item, call in using, excuse me, if you're calling in to comment, please mute your television or streaming device and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have been you have commented on your item of interest. And now I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Watkins? Here. Calantari Johnson? Here. <clears throat> Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Golder, Councilmember Golder is absent. Um, Vice Mayor Bruner? Good afternoon, I'm present. And Mayor Myers? I'm present. We had, this evening, this afternoon, we have translation services available. For, I'd like to call, call on the city clerk again to introduce our translator and provide the instructions to utilize the translation services. Thank you, Mayor. Um, today we have Peter to help assist with interpretation needs. Um, so if anybody needs to utilize them, if we could just have presenters and council speak slowly so that he can um, accurately interpret. Um, in addition, the PowerPoint that are gonna be shown will also be made available post-meeting to the public. Um, the instructions on how to use the function are on the screen right now. Um, one key thing to note is if you do need interpretation, oh wait, let me back up. I needed Peter to translate the stuff I was just saying. Yeah, I was gonna Sorry, say, Peter. okay. Buenas tardes. Para que ustedes sepan, como está diciendo aquí Bonnie Bush, nuestra administradora, de que hay, hay una, una manera para tener la ponencia traducida. Después ella en PowerPoint va a tener, lo va a poder colgar en la red para que uno pueda verificar otra vez las ponencias. Pero mientras también lo que ven ustedes en sus pantallas es como la manera debajo, cuando ustedes estén en su con su computadora, pueden ver de que hay una opción para eh, intérprete. Va a ser en, 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 en inglés, dice interpretation. Y entonces ustedes ahí entran y hay las diferentes idiomas. Entonces ahí pongan español y estarán en un cuarto donde yo estaré traduciendo para ustedes. Gracias. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm not sure what you just read off, but um, one thing that people would need to in order for it to work, they need to be using their audio from a device and not a telephone. Eh, para también lo que le está diciendo es que usted tiene que tener el audio viniendo no de un teléfono, sino no va a funcionar. O sea, que tiene que estar tra eh, conectado con una computadora o con un iPad. Ok. Ok. And then if we could um, call for a raise of hands, if there's anybody in the meeting right now that needs interpretation. Y entonces en este momento, por favor, eh, si usted está en una computadora, utilice la función raise hands para que, para que sepamos si usted necesita en este momento asistencia en español. Gracias. Okay. So we do have one hand raised. Yes. And I can only assume that for interpretation needs. So I'm going to go ahead and add Peter as an interpreter, which is then going to put him in the interpretation room. Muy bien, entonces para la persona que efectivamente anunció que quería asistencia en español, eh, usted tendrá que en ese momento cuando sale usted tendrá que presionar esa parte y presionar después español eh, para que funcione. So the, 
The person with their hand raised is Stephen Bosworth. Oh. Uh, do you want me to check? Confirm, yeah, that would be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. do you require okay. translation, Stephen? Press star six and we'll be able to hear you. Sorry, no. sorry uh, I hovered over the hand right and didn't push it, but I'm sorry I got through to you. Okay, do you, do you require translation? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it doesn't look like we need anyone currently, but maybe every 20 minutes or so we could stop and have Peter check. And as far as recording, do you want me to still uh, translate in the recording interpreter? Not really. We're going to only when we're going to need it. Someone comes in and needs assist assistance. I don't think you need to translate. Um, and Ralph can join at some point. I know there's a meeting that's going to be covered, covering a lot of what's going over tonight. Okay. But thank you. So Peter, I'll just. I'll just um, I'll be watching the attendees and I'll uh, I'll try to you know I'll try to stop and have you ch we'll check in to see if people have joined. Perfect. Okay. Script here. Okay. Our agenda item today is a public hearing to receive input from the community regarding the creation of a district-based election system. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. So I will go ahead and open up this hearing. Um, we will start, uh, I'll introduce our staff person who is the lead on this project, and that's Ralph Demericut, and he will uh, start us off this evening. Welcome, Ralph. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, good evening, members of the council. Uh, Ralph Demericut, Principal Management Analyst with the City Manager's Office, and joining us tonight is Dr. Doug Johnson from NDC, and he'll be doing most of the um, uh, presentation tonight. Um, my role is really to kind of give some context as to how we got here and to really set the stage for his presentation. So I have a very quick PowerPoint um, to share with you all, and then I'll hand the uh, mic over um, to Doug. Um, so today um, we do have a recommendation and um, to the council, and that's to receive this report that we're presenting to you. Um, we're conducting a public hearing um, to receive input on district boundaries and to approve the revised um, timeline. Um, public hearing one and two were pushed back a week, which is a little different from the original timeline that we presented um, back in May. And um, so for those watching, um, and um, council already knows this information, but for those um, at home watching, I did wanna give a summary of past actions just to give a little bit of context as to how we um, arrived. Um, um, the, um, in, back in February of 2020, the city received a claim of violation of the CVRA, and um, it threatened suit unless the city transitioned to a district-based electoral system. And um, while the city um, denies that its at-large election system violates the CVRA um, to avoid the cost and uncertainty with litigation, um, the city signed a settlement agreement back in May and um, whereby the city agreed to consider a resolution of intention to transition to district elections for the November 2022 election. And um, also in May, May 26, 2020, um, council passed resolution number NS 29,657. And um, that was attached as backup material to this item today. And um, in that resolution, um, the council determined that the public interest would be better served by transitioning to a district-based electoral system because of one, the extraordinary cost to defend against a CVRA lawsuit, um, two, the risk of losing such a lawsuit, which would require the city to pay the prevailing plaintiff's attorney's fees, and three, um, the reimbursable attorney's fees would be capped at a maximum of $30,000 by following the procedures set forth. 
And um, also before the November 2022 regular election, the city council will consider adoption of an ordinance to institute a district-based election system. Um, in May, uh, we then, um, after that resolution was passed um, in November of 2020, uh, this into a professional services agreement with a demographer expert, um, National Demographics Corporation, or NDC, and we'll just we'll talk about um, them a little bit more in the next uh, upcoming slides. Um, but their uh, scope of work includes developing and refining the city's election districts, including um, working with city staff to district and database, uh, preparing draft map and election schedule, um, assisting with the public meetings and the plan adoption, and um, including working um, with the county registrar voters. And um, in May 11, 2021, we approved, uh, council approved the initial schedule and staff also published the um, the website and the link to the website is on the screen and I'm, I encourage members of the public to visit it. Um, there's a lot of very useful information on there and we'll continue to update it throughout this whole process. Um, and um, we try and answer as many of the frequently asked questions um, on there as well. A lot of good contact information is on there too in case anyone has any questions. And um, lastly, a few weeks ago in mid-August, um, staff held a virtual community information session with members of the public where we went over what um, I just went um, over with you guys, um, but in further detail, and we talked about how the city got to where it was and really what the next steps were. And um, so today's public hearing, um, the purpose of this public hearing is to inform the public about the districting process and to hear from the community on what factors should be taken into consideration while creating district boundaries. Um, the next step, I'll go over these very briefly. I believe um, Doug is gonna go over them as well. Um, but then we have our second public hearing um, scheduled for September 18 um, at 10 a.m. and more info will be coming out on that. Um, and then initial maps published um, on or prior to December 31. And then public hearings three and four um, will be in January and February. And then in March of 2022, there's a, my apologies, um, a public hearing will be held to adopt a preferred district map and to introduce an ordinance to transition to a district-based system. 2020 and 2021 just flew by and I keep forgetting we're looking at March of 2022 now. So, okay, let me get back on here. So NDC, um, the National Demographics Corporation, um, they've served hundreds of local governments in California, Arizona, and Nevada since their founding in 1979. Um, NDC has performed work in all regions of the country, serving clients as varied as community service districts, water districts, healthcare districts, airport districts, school districts, cities, counties, and states. Um, they have successfully completed 375 projects. And th their website says NDC can easily say no company has been responsible for successfully districting and redistricting more local governments. And um, I added a slide here, Doug, that I didn't share with you. Um, I, I added right before the meeting. Um, so tonight, um, joining us from NDC is, um, NDC's president, Dr. John Center Doug, and um, initial, he started out as a senior analyst with NDC. Uh, he is now the president over there. And um, what's really important, really, really, really um, impressive resume is that he's worked on over 250 districting and redistricting projects across California, Nevada, and Arizona between 2001 and today. And if members of the public are interested in learning more about him, uh, please visit NDC's website. Um, I, I didn't want to put your whole bio on there, Doug, but I thought that that was the most important part that I uh, that members of the council and public would be interested in tonight. Uh, so with that, I'll hand the um, microphone over to Doug uh, to take over the uh, presentation. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. And, uh, and it is a pleasure to be with you. Um, Ralph noted that most, important part may be the experience. I would also add, um, uh, perhaps the most important part is actually I'm class of 88. <laughs> I spent most of my high school years working at the uh, United Artists Movie Theaters, the Del Mar and, and uh, sadly the now defunct um, River Theater. Um, so I, I've 
spent a lot of time in Santa Cruz, know the area well. And we did, I and, and my firm just uh, finished helping the uh, city school district through its transition to district elections, um, I guess about 18 months ago, maybe two years ago now. Uh, and we're working with them on their updating their lines now. So it is a pleasure to meet all of you. Um, and we'll note before I launch this, I do have one logistical issue of, I have planned out my day very carefully and I'm somewhere to do this presentation, but I do not have power. So if my laptop dies after my presentation, I have a tablet here. So if I disappear, I'll be back in. Okay. So my apologies for that. <laughs> but I will get much. through the, pres I have plenty of power to get through the presentation. So, so let me uh, launch the presentation here and I'll share my screen. Oops. Share my screen, there we go. So this is our looking forward to and talking all about the different parts of the city. Um, first of all, as, as the council is aware of it, the public may not entirely grasp what's going on here is there are three main election systems in California. The, the city has employed what's called an at-large system historically where you have citywide elections and everybody runs from wherever they live and the rest of many cities are up that year. That's what the overwhelming majority of California jurisdictions were until about 20 years ago. Um, there's also a few cities that are what are called from district or residence district, uh, where, where you have to live in a given district, but the election's still citywide. There were only about five of those until 20 years ago, and now I think we're down to two uh, that still use that system. And then there's a system that the city is moving to, which is called by district. So in this system now, residents um, will only vote for the council member from their district, and the council members have to uh, live in and run for the specific district. And, and the city is certainly not alone in making this transition. We're well over 150 cities have now made this transition in just the last 20 years to by district elections, all driven by the, uh, the California Voting Rights Act and its goals. Uh, Ralph covered most of the timeline. The, the only uh, piece I wanted to add in here, just because it's a little confusing, is that the census data, the official 2020 census data, as you've likely heard, were released on August 12th. So we have the federal census data. The catch is, is that for the first time ever, California is going to adjust that data. And so the, the state is gonna take the state prison population and count all those prisoners at their last known home address. So while the federal census data is out, our official California redistricting data is not yet released. That's gonna come out sometime in mid to late September. So that is one uh, reason why we don't have this, the official uh, demographics and, um, yet, and we don't have the tools launched yet because we're waiting for that official database. And as you heard, then we'll be looking at um, uh, he additional hearings and draft map discussions in January and February, looking to adopt a map in March uh, prior to the April 17th uh, deadline for plans to be adopted uh, for next November's election. So key slide here, what are the rules for how these districts get drawn? Uh, there are really three baskets of rules. The first on the far left are the federal laws. So number one, we have to have an equal number of people in each council district. There's a little bit plus or minus allowed there, but it really is a very strict requirement. Then we have to uh, comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, which really means that if there's a neighborhood that is particularly concentrated of one, what the law calls a protected class, uh, but it really means Latinos, African Americans, Asian Americans, or Native Americans. If there's a neighborhood that's heavily made up of one of those uh, protected classes, we have to be sure not to divide that neighborhood in a way that dilutes their voting strength in any way. And at, and at the same time, uh, federal law bars racial gerrymandering. So race can be one consideration. You know, when I talked about the Federal Voter Rights Act, I talked about neighborhoods that are heavily a protected class. You'll see we can estimate the ethnic, ethnicity of every city block. And when race becomes predominant factor, for example, if you start drawing lines just based purely on the colors that I'll show you on the map, then that is too far. So those are federal laws. Obviously the maps we bring to you will be sure comply with all those. 
Now we have a new state law called the Fair Maps Act that just kicked in in January 1st of 2020. So if you've talked to folks from cities that went through this process before January 1st, they did not have these rules in place. So the new Fair Maps Act says that the following criteria in this priority order are state requirements. So first of all, geographically contiguous. Each part of each district must touch uh, each other part of the district. Number two is we must strive to have to avoid dividing neighborhoods or communities of interest. And I'll come back to both of those topics in a minute. Number three, we want to follow easily identifiable boundaries. So the river, the freeway, major roads, things that are easy for voters to understand. So that when they go out and want to knock on doors for a candidate, it's easy for them to know which doors to knock on. And uh, we wanna avoid kind of cutting through neighborhoods and things like that and try to follow easily identifiable boundaries. And then the fourth state re uh, requirement is to, is to try to be compact. And they define not bypassing one group of people to get to a more distant group of people. The state also includes a prohibition. So in addition to those four requirements, they also prohibit that you cannot favor or discriminate against a political party. So straightforward enough, we just don't look at, at political party related data in this process. So those are the statutes and all the requirements, things you, you must and must not do. In this third basket is other traditional redistricting principles. So these are not things that you're required to consider, but they're also not prohibited. And they're things that the courts have previously said are okay in redistricting processes. Um, so number one, this doesn't apply in districting, but it comes up when you redistrict, is minimizing the number of voters shifted for election years. So if, if, if you were already in districts and someone's expecting to vote in 2022, we try not to bump them into the 2024 seat. That obviously doesn't apply here when you're moving two districts, but it is a common consideration in this third bucket. You can, um, after you meet all the requirements, you can consider uh, what we would describe as respecting voters' choices and continuity in office. Essentially, you can try to keep the council members in separate seats. We view this and describe this really as letting the voters decide which council members have earned re-election, um, rather than the lines dictating the voters that you may want to re-elect these two or three, but you can't. So that is something that's in this third bucket that you can consider, again, only after you've met all the other statute, uh, statutory requirements, if you wish to consider it. Then future population growth, I mentioned there's a couple of percent flexibility in that equal population requirement. If you know a district's gonna grow faster than the others, you can underpopulate it a little bit now, knowing it's gonna grow faster than the others over the course of the decade. And then again, if we were redistricting, the other traditional principle is kind of trying to preserve the core of existing districts. This is so folks that have organized and passed elections in a district can continue to work together and, and continue to use that network. Again, it's something that'll come up when you redistrict in 10 years, not really a factor this time around. So of course, data play a big part in this. I'm not gonna go through all this data, um, but uh, do provide a lot of socioeconomic data in, in every project we do, because often that is helpful in trying to identify communities of interest. Uh, I won't go through it all, but you can see on the right, there's things like immigration, uh, percentage of, of the population's immigrants versus um, and how many of them are naturalized, language spoken at home. And then in the middle right, you can see uh, one that comes up a lot is housing stats, looking at where the single family versus multifamily homes, renters versus ho owner occupied homes, all this data I'll show you we can provide on maps. But the big numbers are in the top left. The 2020 census population, and again, this is the census population. It's not the official redistricting data yet, but it's gonna be pretty close. It's just under 63,000. If that number six is noted in, in blue on the left, you're looking at just under 9,000 uh, each of the seven districts, uh, assuming you keep seven uh, districts. I did note as well, I did a quick check and the uh, census count for the university uh, uh, population was 8,800. So it is just just under uh, the, the same population as the district. The big thing I was really checking is we're seeing places where the universities might have been missed because of COVID and everything. And it can confirm that uh, the 
all of the census uh, data from the university areas slightly higher than it was in 2010. So they, they did get the university population, thankfully. I mentioned we can map the data. Uh, quickly show you a couple of maps related to the Voting Rights Act. Um, on these maps, the, the, it's called a heat map. The purple and blues are low percentages. Um, getting up to the, the greens are where you get, um, in this case, Latinos to be a majority of CVAP. That's citizen voting age population. It's what the courts look at as a measure of eligible voters. So you do get a, uh, really down in the beach flats area it's where you really get uh, Latinos are, are a majority of the eligible voters in that area. Um, you get a couple of the red census blocks popping up other places, but those are generally very small population census. The one in the, in the far uh, right looks fairly big. That's just geographically big, it's not a lot of people. For Asian Americans, um, really the only area where they, they show up as more concentrated than anywhere else is the university and the university housing. Um, again, we get one, you see the arrow in the top right, there's one census block that's uh, over 75% Asian American uh, among eligible voters, but it only has 14 residents. So it's, it's a small area and that's not gonna influence the demographics of a, of a district as we're drawing it. And then the third uh, group that plays into uh, account here is African Americans. And you can see no concentrations like we get with Latinos but you do get slightly higher percentages, still less than half, but slightly higher percentages down again in the Beach Flats area a little bit. Uh, Americans are such a low number, they, they're, the whole city is purple essentially, so they don't show up. So those are your protected classes for that Voting Rights Act uh, consideration. And really the area we're looking at primarily is the Beach Flats. All those other socioeconomics can be mapped they're not as precise. We don't. We get them by census block group or by track, not by individual blocks. But you can see general trends. So for example, I just pulled one up to use as a demonstration here. This is showing uh, the percentage of residents or percentage of households that are occupied by renters. So the purple areas is less than 25%. The shades of blue is 25 to 50. And then the greens and yellows, it's just over. And the reds are 75% or more. So mapping kind of data that can help be useful as you look at, and the community tries to testify about um, communities of interest. So I mentioned the communities of interest in neighborhoods. When we're defining those, uh, there are really two questions. What the um, neighborhoods in question? So asking people, where do you live? How do you define your neighborhood? In particular, what are its geographic boundaries? Obviously, if we wanna keep a neighborhood together in a map, we need to know what the boundaries of that, that neighborhood are. And really, the, the definitions can be whatever people consider. Area between major roads, area around a park, area around a school, whatever residents testify about. And then if we don't get testimony from an area, then we can look at zoning records, uh, you know, uh, specific plans, housing developments, things like that that may assist in defining neighborhoods. Um, and so there are two things in the law. One is neighborhoods, the other is communities of interest. They're roughly the same idea, but communities of interest might be a little bit broader and there could be a shared social or economic interest. Um, it could be an area that's, there's a, an impact of a county or city policy. Uh, really we're looking to tell, hear the community's stories. And then the key thing in deciding if something is a community of interest is would it benefit from being included within a single district for purposes of its council representation? Some areas, you know, we get like the senior, um, senior housing developments. They actually think they're better off in multiple council districts, multiple uh, areas. Same thing tends to happen in school districts where school attendance areas want multiple trustees that are, are answerable to them. So sometimes they don't, uh, uh, what you might think of as a community might not want to be in a single district. Um, and so it might make sense. And so then it wouldn't technically be a community of interest. It would just be an area we could talk about. And this comes up a lot. One area that might be relevant, when we did Claremont, California, the, the Claremont colleges are, are a big population chunk, similar to the university here. But because the students turn over so fast and so many of them registered to vote back home, they actually didn't want, Claremont made the decision that it didn't want one district in the covering the colleges because they were afraid they wouldn't get it. 
So they actually divided that, they decided it was not a community of interest, and they divided that area up among seats to ensure that um, there wasn't a seat that no one ran for, essentially. Uh, one thing of note here at the bottom, it does highlight, by law, the, the definition of a community of interest may not be defined by a relationship with a party or what comes up more, more often locally, an incumbent or a candidate. If, if there's an area that says, we all really like person X, we want them to represent us, well, that cannot be the definition of a community of interest. There needs to be some other story about what ties that area together. And I covered this largely. Um, again, this is the big new piece of the Fair Maps Act is this requirement that a community of interest be defined and that really becomes, after contiguity, the top uh, state consideration once you meet the federal and draw contiguous districts. But we do need to note, as people talk about their community, it has to be geographic. It has to be something we can identify on a map in order to keep it together. So as we go through this process, we really wanna encourage the public to get engaged. So we do have a variety of tools that we're looking at to include in this process. I do wanna uh, emphasize that the, or these are empowerment tools. If folks are not, no requirement to use any of these. These are simply options for those that are comfortable with them. And they range from all levels of technical skill, from a really simple way to look at maps without drawing them, all the way up to uh, options for power users to draw lines. Let me just quickly flip through these. Obviously, we'll get into them in more detail as the project goes along, and once we have that data and we launch these tools. First of all, there's the, what we call the interactive review map. This is just a map where we'll put data and we'll put the draft maps. It's essentially as easy to use as Google Maps. You just zoom in and out. You can enter an address and it'll jump to that address. But over on the right, you see the layers options. People can click on the different draft maps and they'll be able to see the differences between different plans. And you can actually, you can switch it to a satellite view and go in and see an individual house if you wanna see how plan treat as an individual house. So it's very handy as a, as a review tool, but it's not a mapping tool. Um, of course, anytime that we're doing anything online, we also want to offer offline options for those that aren't comfortable online or that uh, do not have uh, internet access or don't have good internet access. So we'll always have a tool um, whenever we have an online mapping tool. So we do what we call a public participation kit. It's just a simple map where we divide the city up into small geographic units and we give people the population numbers for each of those units. So they can add them up until they get to the right number and then uh, send in that map. So it's very simple, easy to use, and, and obviously an offline option. For those that are a little more um, adventurous and that are comfortable with Microsoft Excel, we also throw in a, a, a version that instead of population numbers, it just has ID numbers. And, it, and then you enter those numbers into Excel, and Excel will do the math for you, and will tell you the demographics. Again, it's not worth learning Excel to use this, but as we find more and more people are used to Excel, this is a very popular way for a simple line. It does require a computer, obviously, but it doesn't require good internet access. Um, could I um, possibly ask you to just briefly stop for one moment? I'm gonna just have Peter um, Peter, could you announce maybe if people need tr Spanish translation just briefly so we can see if, I don't believe there's anyone out there, but um, maybe you can make a quick announcement, Peter. Eh, tardes, eh, queremos eh, tomar esta oportunidad para si alguien necesita traducción, por favor, eh, con la computadora, usted levante la mano. Ahí en, en la parte baja del computador puede decir raise hands para que usted eh, tenga la oportunidad de tener esto traducido en español. Okay, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Okay, thank you, Peter. Go ahead, Doug. Sorry to interrupt. No problem, thank you. So, and I'm getting close to the end here. Um, one tool that is, is brand new this, this year and is proving incredibly popular is actually from Tufts University, Star or Districter. This is a really simple tool to use. Um, we worked with Tufts, and so we have a partnership where they will take all that socioeconomic data that we have on renters and, and language spoken at home and things like that, and they will put it in this tool so people can use it. And then if you look at the top right of the screen, 
There's simply the, the hand that pans the, that moves the screen around, a paintbrush, and an eraser. And literally, that's it. <laughs> so it's really easy to use. People can zoom in and draw just their neighborhood, just their community, or they can draw a whole district map of the whole city. So this is a very popular tool that um, we're finding to be definitely the dominant uh, tool people are using this time around. And then there's a power user tool um, called the Maptitude Online Redistricting. This provides, it, it, it has a learning curve. Take some time to watch some videos and figure out how it works uh, because it is the power user tool. Um, but it does provide us all the data that we have on as your professional demographers on our computers and all of the tools that we have available to us to draw and, and submit maps. So um, it does come uh, with six built-in languages too. There's just a down you can see in the top here where it says English, just a little pull down uh, for all those uh, languages. So this is the only one that has built-in language translation. District R actually works with your internet browser's translation. Um, as does the interactive review map. So that's a quick uh, introduction to this topic, to the tools that will be coming once the data is released. Really the, the big factor in all of this is understanding what are the neighborhoods and communities of interest that we need to use, and that we need to identify and use as building blocks once it's time to, to uh, build draft map options and ultimately for the uh, council to adopt its uh, chosen plan. So that's my presentation. Switch back here to the regular view. And uh, happy to answer any questions that uh, the council or the public have and look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Doug. Um, so we'll go ahead and spend a little bit of time uh, with uh, questions, and then I would like to take it out to uh, the public for questions as well, if that's okay with you, Doug. Um, and for those who are interested in uh, commenting, you'll want to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand when we get done with council questions. Um, so why don't we go ahead, um, I don't see, Peter, any additional folks that have joined still at the same amount. I do see one hand up, so Scott, there's a couple of hands that have come up. We'll get to you after some council questions. Um, and uh, I will go ahead and have council member Cummings. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Doug, for that presentation. Uh, <clears throat> I'm kind of curious, kind of just based on this map and you know your extensive experience with doing demographic mapping, imagine as well that you've probably done some maps for cities that may have been sued under these types of uh, conditions. And one thing I'm curious about is, is how does our map compare to some other cities? I'd imagine that there are some cities where these types of demographic studies have been done where it's pretty clear that you have um, concentrated populations that aren't represented. Um, but in San so based on the map that you showed, it, it's really unclear you know, how we would be, how unprotected groups would be benefited by redrawing these maps, just based on the fact that for the past 10 years, uh, we've had people from, um, uh, from protected classes elected in every single election, and oftentimes they're the dominant group that's been elected in these elections. So that's, it. now I think it's great that we have this new map that we didn't have before, but it, I, I, I'm just concerned because it doesn't seem like by going to district elections, that's actually gonna improve uh, seeing more representation when, for example, right now we have a council that is 100% uh, dominated by people from protected classes. So I'm just wondering if you can provide some context on those maps you've seen in the past and, and how we compare to some of those areas, or to, to some other cities where they might've ha actually had problems with representation on the councils. Oh, you're muted. Get it, Doug. Sorry, sure. We have seen you know across the spectrum um, jurisdictions where moving to district elections, you know, took them from zero to three Latinos on the council kind of thing. Um, uh, jurisdictions where it made no change, and actually jurisdictions where they went backwards uh, after they went to district. So it's hard to 
to do, you know, to make any specific comments, um, you know, a number of jurisdictions have been threatened lawsuits. Some of them, it's very clear there's a problem. You know, they probably were in violation of the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, there's, you know, the one Merced, they immediately switched when they got the letter because they had not had a Latino on the council. You know, they actually couldn't vote on a zoning issue because uh, four of the five council members lived within 500 feet of the parcel in question. Um, so that, you know, there are some clear cut cases of where there was a problem and they fixed it. Um, there are, of course, at the other end, uh, you know, Poway, the city as a whole was 13% Latino. Uh, the most Latino district you could draw was 16%. And, you know, that's within the margin of error. So we've seen it all across the spectrum without a doubt. Great, thanks. And I don't know, um, maybe this can go, maybe you can answer this, or maybe our legal team can answer, but I'm wondering if there's any cities out there that switched to district elections and then got sued because they actually went backwards and had less representation on their councils after making that move. Yeah, no, there's no grounds for that. The laws, the California laws requirement is simply that you have district elections. Um, there's no requirement that it actually achieve the goal of increasing representation. Um, it simply matter you go to you go to districts and you're in a safe harbor from the California law. Um, if you draw the law legal, then you're going to violate the Federal Voter Rights Act. Um, but that's only because you gerrymander against, a, a, you know, to, to dilute the voting strength. There's no requirement that uh, any going to districts increases or even keeps the same representation on the council. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Other questions from council members at this time? I'm not seeing any. Um, Doug, in our re in our recent, well, in our current status um, uh, as council, in the 2022 election would be the one that we would have, I believe, three seats open for a district election because those would be normally run in 2022. Um, how do we sort through that type of initial dis kind of um, run for those particular council members? Is that um, kind of negotiated with the public, basically, and the candidates, or how how has that been done in the pot in cities that have that, that that has come up with? Sure. Well, the requirement is that you have to have the same number of seats up in 2022 as there are seats that would normally come up if you weren't switching. Okay. And so if you have three seats that come up in 2022, then you have to have three districts. That just keeps the same number of people on the dais. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the remaining seats would be up in 2024, obviously. Which of those seats end up as the ones being up? That is decided by the council at the time that you adopt the map. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, you know, if it just happens to work out that each council member is a separate seat, well, then you just assign the three seats where the three council members are whose terms end in 2022. That's, it's pretty rare that, any, that it, the pieces fall into place like that. So then it can be a tough, uh, tough decision. Ideally, council members who end up in the same seat are both on the same cycle, so that both then run, and the voters would then choose which one got selected to represent that seat. Um, if two council members who are in different election cycles end up in the same seat or more than two, then if there's someone who's term ends in 2022 and they end up in 2024 seat, then their current term will be their last and they won't be able to run again in 20, when they term ends in 2022, they'll have to sit out for two years and then they could run as a non-incumbent in 2024. Um, gets even more complicated if it goes the other way, um, but hopefully we won't run into that situation. Okay. So that's something that you, we work through with you, and then that's part of that discussion with uh, the, the when we do adopt the map. So that's all done through these public hearings and other discussions. Exactly, exactly. And, and it can be kind of, it's hard to put your mind around it purely theoretical because there's so many scenarios. But once you're down to a map or to a couple of final maps, then it's much more concrete and easier to, to address. Okay, thank you. Yep. I had a, uh, another question that came to mind. 
I know in communities that adopt district elections, they also, especially for those who don't have a direct elect mayor, they also um, I try, need to establish a process for how they determine that mayor. So for example, Watsonville rotates amongst the different districts. And I'm wondering, is that something that we'd need to discuss um, in terms of how to incorporate that in our process? Because it, it's currently, um, you know, we use the, the criteria that a person gets first or second in the election and traditionally they've rotated into that seat. But if we have a new council um, this is, that's been voted in by districts and somebody who should become mayor is voted in under the at-large system, I'm just kind of wondering how the establishment of the mayor would work under those circumstances and if that's something we need to determine before or is that something that would be newly established when we establish the districting process? Um, and you would have to look at your process and, and probably reconsider how you do it just because, as I mentioned, districts are drawn based on total population. So you'll end up with certain districts that have much higher voter turnout than others do. Mm -hmm. And so simply who gets the most votes, it would always be the same district <laughs> um, and likely the same vote. So you probably do want to revisit that. Uh, but that could be something you could do after the map is adopted or at any point in the process. Along those lines, Doug, um, do cities typically, in that situation, do they typically like rotate the mayor by districts, typically? It uh, takes all forms or does it just take all forms? It, it takes all forms, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, some do two years, some do one year. Uh, there is a, a huge range of options, definitely. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Doug, for showing that presentation. Um, I've learned a little bit more. And uh, my question also centered around um, the district and the mayor uh, and, and that process. And I know that since the purpose public hearing is to hear um, input from the community as to what factors would be taken into consideration um, with these uh, boundaries, these districts, and creating district boundaries in these maps. Progress. And uh, one of the, the things that had come up was also I, I, the idea of six districts and a, 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 a elected mayor and and the difference with seven districts versus that and versus when the city charter would need to get changed in that process. I think if someone could touch on that briefly and how that ties into this before we go into input, that might be helpful. Yeah, and I will defer to the legal counsel on that one. <laughs> I see, yeah, Tony. Thank you. I'm going to ask Kathy to weigh in here just briefly. So, um, currently, the remedy that's provided under the CDRA for um, an alleged uh, is to establish district boundaries, and so that that sort of defines the the actions that the that are uh, available to the city uh, under the Voting Rights Act. Um, we're also, however, constrained by the charter, which specifies that the city council shall elect one of its uh, members to have the title of mayor. And so, um, so when you talk about a, a an at-large elected mayor, um, we're really talking uh, in all likelihood about a charter amendment versus the, the relatively more simple process that we're. Uh, we're on track for right now, which is an ordinance that would establish district elections. And that would not require a amendment? No, based on the case law, um, that many cities that have charter provisions uh, specifying at large elections have, have uh, transitioned to um, district elections by ordinance. Um, and the reason and the legal basis for it is that it's in compliance with the CDRA as opposed to um, uh, under the charter. And to, to change, to, yeah, and to change the city charter, that uh, 
that process that is by vote? Of um, in order to amend the city charter, you need to go to the voters with a proposed charter amendment. Have we done fairly recently? In fact, we have one uh, that's right now with regard to the um, uh, Children's Fund Act of 2021. Okay. Kathy? I don't have anything to add beyond what Tony said. He's got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Watkins, did you want to, did you have questions? I saw your hand go up. Yeah, no, my question was asked by Vice Mayor in regards to what I think our community has really asked um, in terms of kind of what the scope of potential could be, particularly as it would relate to a directly elected mayor, but it appears that we have that answer at this point. So thank you, Tony, for that explanation. Um, but, but, but while I have the floor, really quick, I'll just say, Doug, I'm a, I'm a Mariner too. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> go Mariners. And then, um, in regards to the, the council, I, and I know you kind of answered this, but so maybe it's more, I don't, you know, if you want to elaborate on it, but although there has been minority representation elected at large, there has not been the majority minority representation of our Hispanic and Latino and Latinx population on the council. But I heard from your presentation is as the maps are drawn, there could potentially be more likelihood for um, a, a Latino to be elected to council um, in the spirit of what I think the intention of this law is trying to do based on the potential for that district to have opportunity for that demographic. Is that accurate? And to a degree, yes. So whatever district the beach flats ends up in, as uh, presuming we obviously keep it together, that neighborhood together, that district will certainly have a higher Latino percentage than the city as a whole does currently. Okay. So that's kind of the goal of the CBRE is to maximize their voting strength in that one district. Definitely. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Council Member Cummings, did you have another question? And I'll go to Council Member Collintar Johnson. Yeah, and then I'll I did. To public comment after this. Yeah, I'll keep it brief. I did. I kind of wanted to follow up on the question I asked earlier because I'm just wondering, you know, if we do see a reduction in representation on the council as a result of this going through, could a similar argument be made that the system that we have creates a bias in our electoral system that prevents certain people from other protected classes getting elected? Uh, I will. Tony, jump in and correct yeah, me. If you I was going to target. I was going to ask that to the legal the same. Yeah, I, yeah. I think um, I think Doug uh, sort of answered that question previously in regards to PVRA provides for is a transition to district elections, but it doesn't provide a mechanism for doing the reverse. So if we found that um, there is actually uh, less representation of uh, protected groups on the council as a result of district elections. I suppose the potential uh, remedy would be to return to some form of at-large based uh, elections, but we would then be, you know, facing the same liability exposure that we are right now in terms of, um, you know, a claim of a CBRA violation. Yeah, yeah. There's certainly no no provision under the California Voter Rights Act where they could bring that challenge. Uh, it would have to create a federal challenge to come up with that approach. I guess ultimately we could see, and it sounds like it's happened in other in other communities where they switched the districts and they've actually had less diversity on the sure. Okay, I just wanted that to be clear because I think that that's really probably. I mean, it's, it's it's a concern I think that many people in the community have, and um, and I just want to make sure that that's, that's out there. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Kontari Johnson. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Doug. Um, do you have the information around the citizen population for the beach flats? And I know it's a small area. Um, yes, we have it. Census block by census block. That's the data that we're showing, kind of city block by city block. Um, I haven't like 
drawn any draft maps or like put that area into a district to find out what that expected percentage would be. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the trick of the Fair Maps Act is it actually encourages just give the public time to weigh in first. Mm -hmm. It actually prohibits the drawing of any uh, council member, or city staff, or consultant draft maps mm -hmm. until a certain amount of time after the data are released. So we can't start drafting districts at all yet. Yeah, no, I understand that. You just, you had a, um, the population for UCSC, so I was wondering if you had that same number for the beach oh. area. Uh, it's a good question. That we actually could tally, and I, I have not done that, but, uh, but I can do that and provide that, certainly. Thank you. Any other questions from council members? Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and open it up for public comment. Um, and uh, this is a public hearing, but uh, Ralph, I'm assuming it is okay for Doug questions regarding this. So I'm hoping that we can have this be sort of a question answer format, but I just wanna double check with Tony if that's okay. And um, also Ralph, if that's an expected um, versus just people having, just doing public comment. I'm just kind of wondering format wise, whether or not we can have, we can have at least questions answered. Yeah, that's fine if that's what we're talking. Okay. So I will call on Scott first, and if you could press star six, Scott. Um, Scott, before you start up, I'm gonna have um, our uh, Spanish um, translator announce one more time in Spanish uh, how people can uh, queue up if they do need translation services. So Peter, can you do that announcement one more time, please? Entonces, eh, si ustedes quieren en este momento hablar o participar, ahorita está abierto la sesión al público. Entonces, si usted quiere comentar algo en español, lo puede hacer sin problema. Cuando usted quiere levantar la mano, tiene que eh, apoyar Star 9 o Estrella 9 en su teléfono para que usted le... después se le dará oportunidad de hablar con Estrella 6. Gracias. Gracias. Okay, um, I will go ahead and start with Scott. And Scott, if you could press star six, um, you're, you're available to speak. Um, Scott, if you so I'm getting a note that Scott is using an older version of Zoom, so I have to promote him to a panelist. Okay. But I'll do that, I'll do that right now. Okay. Okay, I, um, I'm wondering, the original lawsuit that the city decided to settle instead of fight was all based on race. Um, much of the discussion about protected class is all based on race, but then there's a federal law, a actual Supreme Court decision that says you cannot gerrymander uh, districts according to race. So how is the city going to walk this tightrope and not fall into something where they can be sued in federal court? Sure. Tony or Doug, do you want to take that? I'm not sure. Doug, maybe maybe Doug and Cassie can can provide an answer to that. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I'll take I'll take a first pass, and then Cassie can uh, correct me or, or or add to it. Of course. Um, so it is a, a, a fine line we have to walk. So as was mentioned, the primary TVRA driver is race in determining whether or not you're moving to district elections. That yes, no, are we going to districts is primarily race and that's okay. Because it's not how the districts are drawn, it's simply are you going to draw? Then when we're drawing districts, race is one factor in the decision. So obviously we have to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act considering race is one is part of that decision and, and that approach. So we have to consider race. What the federal law bans is race becoming the predominant factor. So usually challenges are based when you end up with these weird shaped districts that are stringing together different, you know, primarily African-American or Latino neighborhoods into one district that goes across multiple communities. So as long as we stick to looking at neighborhoods as a key factor, and then noting those neighborhoods that are heavily one protected class, 
then we're in that, that safe area between the two, where it's a consideration, but it's not the predominant consideration. Cassie, anything to add to that? I think that's a great answer. I would just add that it's, you know, it's very common, multiple cities and other special districts have transitioned to districts um, on the basis of the California Voting Rights Act challenge, um, alleging racial issues. And you know, we haven't seen a ton of, or any that I'm aware of, uh, lawsuits alleging um, a federal Voting Rights Act violation because we trans because there was a transition to de district election based on the California Voting Rights Act. Great, right, thank you, Cassie. Okay, next up I have a caller with the phone number ending in 1810. Please press star six to um, mute or unmute. Um, Mayor, was Scott done? He had a minute, 17 seconds left. Oh, I'm sorry, Scott, is, did you have any other questions, Scott, or comments? Um, well, I'm just wondering if the city's ready to uh, fight a lawsuit for going to district elections, um, or is the city ready to actually let the people of the city vote on whether or not we want district elections? That's, that's all I want to say. Thank you, Scott. Okay, next I have uh, phone number ending in 181, or, yeah, 1810. Please press star six. Star six, and you should be unmuted. Presione estrella seis para que pueda hablar. He's not a Spanish speaker. Garrett, we need to press star six to unmute yourself. You're still muted. Okay, um, Garrett, I'll come back to you. Um, I'll go ahead and move on to Steve Tedesco. If you could press star six to unmute yourself. Oops. You're unmuted, Steve. Okay, my only question is, has the decision been made to stay with seven districts or is there consideration for five or nine? Doug, do you wanna take that one or Cassie? Can maybe Cassie, you can talk from the charter perspective. Yeah, uh, our city charter provides for seven council members. And so changing that um, would uh, most likely require a charter amendment. Thank you. Steve, is that your only question? That was it, thank you very much. Thank you. Next, I have uh, phone number ending in 1810. If you could press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, um, I still can't hear you. Um, okay, I'll, we'll come back to you. I'll move on to Lyra Filippini. Next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome, thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is just out of curiosity based on how it affects, um, you know, us citizens. Um, when we move to this districting, um, structure, is it going to change the fact that right now all of our city council represent each of us um, and we have equal access to all of them? So for instance, if Justin Cummings is not my representative in my district, but I have a specific environmental question and he's an expert in that field, um, you know, I would like to directly access him. So how will that change in our city? Do you want to take a stab at that? Sure, sure. It, it's a very common concern and a very good question. Um, a lot of it ends up depending on the dynamics of the council members. Um, you know, some cities are very deferential. If a call comes in from another council member's district, well, you get referred over to that council member. Others keep much more of a big picture view. So it really depends on the dynamics. And it's been interesting as we work with 
now a couple hundred jurisdictions going through this process of almost universally council members who previously ran at large and have gone through the transition, you know, everyone in the city knows them, everyone still calls them, they still take all the calls. You know, it's it when the cultural challenge comes up is really once you start getting council members who have never run citywide. So when you start getting new council members who just are run by district, that's where the culture of the council and the culture of the city will will be challenged to see if if they maintain that kind of citywide perspective and openness to everyone or start deferring and referring calls over to the others. But there's no official um, law or ordinance or anything that meet, that impacts that. It's simply a kind of accepted practice amongst council members. Okay, thank you so much for for that answer. Um, the the next one is I, I wanted to thank you for your redistricting rules and goals slide and information, and especially for the third column, um, and draw your attention to the future gr population growth. So as we are um, beginning this process, I was wondering if you are um, using our current zoning and land use information that shows that we have certain zoning along certain streets um, where currently there's just commercial um, buildings, but where they may be um, mixed use high density or mixed use medium density that not only would allow a huge jump in population, especially with these new state housing laws um, very quickly to happen, but also that we have density bonus laws um, in conjunction with that. So the current zoning for say, you know, 55 units an acre um, could result with 145 units for that acre due to things like, you know, SROs in our land use element. So how, how are we going to um, incorporate that into this formula? So uh, it is in how much we can accommodate. So we're really just playing within the margins that the equal population balance requires, which is really, Technically, it's a little different, but as a rule of thumb, it's plus or minus 5% at the most. So if we're looking at you know, about 9,000 people in a district, then we're probably, so we can underpopulate the district by 450. Mm -hmm. and, and it's rare that the numbers in the neighborhoods work out that, that smoothly. So we're only talking about having a little bit of flexibility for a couple hundred people. The other piece is keep in mind that the lines will be redrawn every 10 years. So after every census, the council will go through this process again. So the focus of that expected growth tends to be on approved projects that are under construction. You know, if, if our 500 units in a development in one particular part of the city, then we'd pay more attention to that. I'm not familiar with any jurisdiction where we've looked at the potential for future growth, you know, just simply the zoning rules and, and taking that into consideration. Um, just because we are talking about a relatively short time frame of just 10 years, and you want to be a little more specific in your justifications and knowing there are X number of units in it and not in other parts of the city. So we're going to underpopulate by a couple hundred people. Great. Any other questions, Valera? Oh, great. So I didn't know I had more time. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, just to kind of further on that, Doug, because thank you. That was a good Oh, I'm sorry. If, uh, we'll have time, you know, if you want to queue up again, we'll see uh, kind of where we're at. Um, but hopefully those got you some questions. I don't know if you have, well, let me get through everybody else and we'll see where we're at. But thank you for your question. The next uh, person to get queued up is ending in phone number 5542. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Press star six to unmute yourself and you should be able to speak. Bonnie, is there any issues that I'm not right, the right uh, nope. instructions tonight? No, because it's working for most people. Oh, here we go. There we go. You're, we can hear you now. Good afternoon, Council and Mayor. Today's meeting is, feels premature regarding creating district-based elections. 
Caving into an ambulance chasing law legal threats is not only unwarranted in ill times, but you become complicit in undermining our local sovereignty and state constitution. Rather than moving post haste with establishing district elections, your role now should be to protect our local sovereignty <clears throat> that protects authority of charter cities. Today, you should center around directing our city attorney to work with other affected cities in a legal strategy to challenge the claims forcing district elections without a vote of the people to change the charter, city charter. <clears throat> By proceeding, there appears acceptance of creating district elections without a mandatory vote. You cannot establish changes to the city charter by ordinance. This must be challenged. It must be. The city of Santa Monica case pending before the state Supreme Court may provide the necessary clarity. Let's at least wait for the Supreme Court decision before moving ahead because it's in their docket now. The important issue at hand is the rule and authority of the city charter that must be followed and upheld and not circumvented. A public vote after creating district elections is cynical at best. What happens if it's defeated? If the city charter is to be altered, then there's a clear legal process that must be followed. Your job, your job is to protect local sovereignty and not undermine it. Thank you for your time and thoughtful attention. Thank you. Um, I don't know if Tony or Cassie or Doug want to provide any comment back on some of those points. I'm mean, whatever you. I would just add this charter issue is something that's come up in prior cases, and you know there is pretty firm case law uh, to show that or to hold that you know the California Voting Rights Act basically preempts the city's charter. So. That issue has been litigated. It does come up in the Santa Monica litigation. I don't expect that case to rely upon the charter issue. That's more about um, what does it take to establish a CVRA violation. That's the main uh, issue in that case. And um, on this issue of cities sort of coming together, you know, I would add that the um, Cal Cities, formerly known as the League of Cities, um, is very involved in this and um, submitted an amicus brief in the Santa Monica case and um, is, is trying to uh, put that position out that, there on behalf of cities. And, and just, I know the council knows this, but the public may not realize it. The Santa Monica is fighting this. They won't say exactly how much they've spent, but the estimates are they've spent somewhere around seven to eight million dollars, maybe more, on their defense. So it's uh, it's bold and brave of them, and we'll go with it. But it it does take writing a really big multi-million dollar check to fight, even if they end up winning. And of course, the plaintiffs in that case have asked for twenty-two million dollars in fees just for the trial phase. They haven't asked for their fees yet for the appeals. So. Uh, it takes writing a really, really big check to, to take that path. Thank you, Doug. Next, I have a skirt. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, City Council, and hello, Doug Johnson, and thank you for coming to give this presentation, and thank you for um, undertaking the very difficult, complicated work of demography. Um, I have a few questions. Um, I'm not sure if I'll get to all of them, but I want to first uh, just start out and say that, you know, here here in Santa Cruz, um, there's a, I, I, okay, so I'm aware that that race was a big part of, of this legislation and a big part of your presentation. I would like to talk about class. Um, in Santa Cruz, uh, the, percentage of um, households which are owned um, by the people who, who live in them is 47%. Uh, um, this comes from the American Community Survey uh, in 2020. Um, and then the percentage of households which are renting is 47%. Uh, uh, so in and that, that, to me, that makes, um, you know, landowners and land occupants, you know, an important class distinction. And then, of course, we also
also have a really high density of uh, vacation rental properties here. Um, and of course the mixed projects which are going up. So I guess I, I, I would like to hear about uh, class. You know, is class a protected status? Um, you know, if we have a majority of renters here um, and a minority of landowners, then, you know, it, 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 what, can, what can we do for district-based elections to help make sure that renters have appropriate uh, representation here um, in our city, which is, you know, rapidly being taken over by real estate <laughs> interest. Thank you. I would briefly say, um, no, class is not a protected class legally under the Voting Rights Act, but certainly areas that are high rentership, you know, all those other socioeconomic features that can go into class can be used to define a, a neighborhood or a community of interest, or, you know, a couple of neighborhoods that are bordering each other that should go together in a district. So you can consider those factors in terms of communities of interest and drawing lines. They just don't have a, a legally protected status. Thank you, Doug. Next, I have phone number ending in 0396. Press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, I think you can hear me now. We can hear you, yep. Yes, um, just a comment. I, I would like to uh, thank Mr. Johnson. It was an excellent uh, presentation. And I, for one, am very excited about the prospect of district elections here in Santa Cruz. Um, uh, as a resident, I had some issues uh, over the years where I felt not having a city council representative uh, for my neighborhood was quite a deterrent. And so I think um, it's a, an exciting change and one that we can really improve representation in Santa Cruz by going to district elections. So thank you so much. Thank you. Next, I have phone number ending in 1810. Wow, that's hard to get through to you guys, isn't it? Anyway, uh, first, this is Garrett. Hey, for starters, the entire justification for this sounds good, but in practice, I doubt it. 37% of the population is white male, but none of the current council is. Good, bring, good luck bringing that demographic into balance since few white men even bother to run in a town like this. Minority representation is not a problem. A lack of political diversity is. Since the object of this is election fairness, how any of this redistricting uh, begins fairly in 2022 is a total mystery to me. Sure, it's fair to vote all seven districts every two or four years, or to alternate three, then the other four districts to vote every four years. But how to fairly begin that from the current system? Which districts vote first? Which districts are chosen to be in the three or four district groupings? Do we pretend at large elected members represent where they live or where they might move to and vote in? needed. The deciders, that's you, have already failed the people, approving, conceding really, that more than half the city could sit out the 2022 elections, while as an as yet undetermined minority of districts could do all the voting, or as bad, pretend sitting members represent them anywhere they move to. If any of that happens, shame on you. Better or would have been uh, normally at large terms in 2022 that should have been adjusted to serve only two years and then transition to a more fairly uh, to the simultaneous seven districts in uh, 2024 and respect the current council terms. Does the plaintiff understand forcing half the population out of representational opportunity to choose in 2022 defeats their purpose? Not if fairness was their goal. Maybe you got some bad be worse is occurring. Any amount of a Lucy explaining of how to do fairness is accomplished uh, other than that in 2022 election, as I explained, uh, will ho ring hollow to me. Pricey demographer, demo, demo, demographer or not, the indicated direction will come from you and published firmly agreed on. Districting goals are needed to avoid the usual political tyrannical rigging. Otherwise, Santa Cruz is uh, unusual insofar as it has a large, okay, thanks, bye. Thank you. Next up is Steve Bos Stephen Bosworth. Press star six, please. Press star six. There you Hello. go. Hello. Hello. We, we can hear you. Oh, good. 
Well, uh, but I, I had a two too. Um, somebody pulled the plug on me at one point. Sorry about that. Um, yes, I, I'm, I'm really uh, quite uh, surprised at uh, the uh, the current seeming plans, seeming firm plans, to go for district elections. This is in spite of the fact that the Santa Monica uh, 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 dispute is still going, and uh, the appeal court for that uh, dispute uh, disallowed the uh, by-election solution that the uh, Kiko uh, neighborhood wanted to have in its place. And an, an argument came in there that uh, if the uh, if the, uh, instead of having districts, instead there was an at-large election continuing, but not using the existing plurality system, but either of two other available uh, voting systems, uh, then the 30% of Latinos, Santa Monica, would have a very good chance of electing at least one member of the seven member council in Santa Monica. So there is a, there are other methods and I'm just wondering, the one thing I'm surprised at because I, I wonder if before the council, uh, I would like to say uh, hooked on to the uh, uh, hypothetical solution of districting, did, did you then uh, engage in research as to what the alternatives are? In Santa Monica, they are considering three. Uh, my my uh, co-authors and myself are having uh, contributing to the dialogue that is going on there. And there's there's two there's two more systems that I think. Can, can you give a commitment that you will have a, a commission called of interested parties to argue about and to consider all the options available? Please do. Can I have a response from each one of the council members on that question? Thank you for your comment. We'll come back to see if any council members um, would like to respond um, and, and I'll allow time for that. I just have one more caller um, that I'd like to get to and then um, we can have uh, additional comment and discussion with council members as appropriate. Um, my, let's see, 4871 is the next number. Thanks. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, yeah. this is coming through. Can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Elise Casby calling in. I would just like to say that I think that this city has had far, 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 far too much politically motivated that is extremely biased um, politics that's posing in the public interest. And I, you know, I know I'm being really direct here, but I do, really do want to say the, the um, unfair and actually devious and stridently unethical recall that unseated two of our fairly elected officials and this was done by a host of city council members, the city staff, the misleading the public. And I just really am tired in Santa Cruz. I'm worn out as an activist to see the actual lack, the true and complete and almost total lack of public discussion that is robust discussion that happens during much of the um, political programs that are underfoot in this city. And so I've named the recall, there's others. Uh, Martine Bernal was fired too, and I think even as many as three times. That guy's leaving today with a lifetime uh, retirement of $200,000 for every single year. And I think that's a crime. I actually think that is a crime. And so this, this street redistricting is, from my sources, which are not perfect, I'll say that, but it's a politically motivated attempt using the guise of making a more diverse and fair electoral body representation. That is in fact another attempt to take out the progressive, the more that fair and ethical voter power. 
Thank you. Next up, I have phone number ending in 1820. I think you've already gone. Is that Garrett again? Hey, can you hear me? Nope. Oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead, please. Great, thanks. Um, hi, um, so I, you, some of you may have listened to a Radio Lab podcast called Tweak the Vote that talked about this topic and whether or not this was a successful um, way to address fairness in elections. And to me, one of the interesting things that it talked about, and I encourage you to listen to it if you haven't, was how geographic diversity is in some cases really beneficial to gain. But but it's not the only kind of diversity, especially in a small town, there's things like experiential diversity, age diversity, protected class diversity, philosophical diversity, previous caller mentioned renter owner diversity. Um, and, and they concluded probably the best way to have diversity in your elections would be to have age diversity because throughout different ages, people do tend to go through uh, all the different things they might, uh, you know, the different values they might have. So I'm just curious, uh, is the decision made here? I mean, is this, is this a guaranteed thing that's going to happen? Um, can we explore these other ideas? Um, it's just like a really valuable thing for us to think this through. I'm not actually sure what the right answer is, um, but uh, <laughs> that's my comment. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands at this point, so I'll go ahead and take it back to the council. Um, I'm, I'm completely fine. Oh, wait, I just saw a hand come up. If you are gonna, Mr. Bosworth, did you, you've spoken already, your hand is still up? Or it came back up? It, it came back up. Okay. 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 I'll take it back to council now. Um, I, I, I'm comfortable with council members um, if they would like to re respond to some of the questions. Um, just want to be aware of people's time and, uh, but yeah, happy to have that that discussion as uh, people see of answering some of the questions coming from the public. Uh, I have uh, Council Member Brown, Council Member Cummings, and then Council Member Watkins. Thank you. Uh, so I do want to say thank you to you, Mr. Johnson, for being here and for doing this work. Uh, to try to help us make our way through a bit of a complicated and um, not entirely uh, clear uh, process given all of the variables and the legality and, and everything this entails. And um, so I, I do look forward to seeing more and hearing more from you as we move through this. I also want to thank the members of the public who are here today. I know it was something that um, I certainly have been um, hoping <laughs> to do um, to get this issue out into the public. We It has been on our open session agenda once previously, but um, for the folks who are listening out there, I think it's worth uh, saying that you know, we've been talking about this in our closed sessions now for quite some time. And um, that is in many ways um, was, was very much appropriate because of the threat of, of lawsuit. Um, but we're not in that paradigm anymore. Um, I mean, that still is obviously a factor and we have legal counsel helping us navigate this. But I have been asking uh, for a long time now, as have some of my colleagues, to get this out on our open agenda and really start to get public input um, and get some of these questions answered. People, I mean, clearly don't um, have, uh, you know, uh, have very much information about um, the fact that this is even happening in the city of Santa Cruz right now, much less um, answers to a lot of the questions. I mean, we're still trying to, to figure out answers. Um, so, you know, I just think it's really important that now that we are, um, you know, daylighting this, that, that we have um, a, a meaningful conversation and that we get really clear about, um, you know, how it is that we respond to, how it is that we make our decisions moving forward. Um, you know, I think we, um, you know, 
a public forum, public forum gives us an opportunity to let our concerns know. And I mean, I've had questions from uh, many, many people about, um, you know, with assumptions that I support this because the council has, um, you know, voted to move through this process. And so I want to make it really clear that I support this process. Um, you know, I just want to say a couple things about that. I, um, I am not fundamentally opposed to district elections. I think they have been, um, you know, helpful in some cases. I mean, I think, uh, Mr. Johnson, you kind of gave the explanation that it really runs the gamut. And we've also heard that the California Voting Rights Act really, or at least the interpretations of it, don't really care whether racially polarized voting or underrepresentation, systematic underrepresentation exists or if district elections could remedy a perceived or actual problem. Um, what we know, and just to be really clear about this piece of it, is that district elections are written into this state law as a safe harbor provision, which means that the reason that, um, or a reason to do this is to uh, protect ourselves from legal exposure. And um, because of that serious concern, we've been, you know, we've been working on it, um, mostly behind the scenes. Um, I think that there are still open questions about that. And, um, you know, so this question of is this, I mean, you know, from my perspective, I don't know if this is a done deal. Um, it feels that way, but, you know, there's a lot there are variables that are gonna, you know, continue to emerge. Uh, we do have, yes, um, our legal counsel has has shared, so you all now know as well, that, um, you know, most jurisdictions have either just gone ahead and done this when faced with this kind of complaint or threat of lawsuit, and the ones who have fought have not won, uh, with the possible exception of Santa Monica, and they have spent, uh, a lot of money to do that. But I want to just say here that, um, and remind everybody that the Santa Monica case, um, and this is Pico, um, I think Pico Neighbors Union versus the city of Santa Monica, um, will be heard by the California Supreme Court. And the question of whether or not um, evident, there needs to be demonstration or evidence provided about racially polarized voting in order to be, um, you know, so legally susceptible to that, um, you know, to being forced to move to district elections or forced into some other kind of system, um, you know, that's still an open question. And we got to, I think it's very important that we say that and that we, um, you know, and for me, the reason I'm saying, saying that I don't support this is because I don't support um, being, you know, I don't believe that um, being strong armed, being kind of extorted, being threatened, um, is a way to responding to that in this way is a good way to make policy. Um, there may be very good reasons to move to district elections. I don't know what they are, um, but I think that's a broader community conversation. So this kind of um, question that lingers, is this a done deal, I think is not, is not yet answered. Um, what will happen with renters? Uh, this is a question that I actually um, has come up multiple times, and I would like to ask this question, right? Um, Tony or Kathy, maybe you can weigh in, or if not, try to help us get an answer to the question of, um, well, what happens if a renter um, is elected in a district, and for whatever reason, either because of the way power works in a landlord or tenant relationship, because of their politics, or just for any other reason. I mean, you know, if a tenant is displaced, is it possible to write something in to allow uh, that elected official to finish out their term? So I guess I'll, I'll ask that question. I do have some more comments, but that's that's the one that's just been on my mind, and so I th figure now is the time, good a time as any to ask. Not seen that done in other jurisdictions. Um, Doug, have you have you seen any renter protections uh, passed in other jurisdictions for uh, council members? You're you muted. Thanks. Yeah, the residency requirement, you know, is the same for everybody. You have to 
you have to live, just as you currently have to live in the city, you have to live in the districts. And if you move out of the district for anything other than a, a very temporary situation, you'd have to resign the seat. Um, so, and that's written in state law. Um, so, and there's no legal way to address that in a district elections context. I mean, the, the charter you can do, you know, charters are charters, you have, you can get very creative in a charter, but that would be unusual. But it is the same, other than the fact that the renter would have a, a smaller pool to move into, it's the same scenario that could happen currently with the citywide council member too. You just have fewer options as, as places to move to. Yeah, and, and many, many fewer for renters out there. <laughs> we, you know, you know that's the case. Um, I'm just gonna say this because you know, I, there are people paying attention to this who know me and know my politics around uh, renters' issues. This is not, I'm asking this because of my particular situation. I'm, you know, on the way to home ownership. I don't have to move. Nobody's going to make me move. Um, I'm termed out. <laughs> you know, this is a question that I am asking on behalf of, um, as one uh, um, speaker suggested, the majority of the Santa Cruz population. Um, so, you know, we should think about that. There, there may not be anything we can do about it, um, but we should be thinking about, and we should be thinking about whether or not there are ways to address this. So I'm just gonna put that in the parking lot for now. We, I know we're gonna have more conversations um, about this. Um, to Mr. Bosworth's question, you know, um, this, this question about, about evaluated, evaluative, um, rank choice voting or proportional representation, I, I guess is the, is the appropriate term. That's a really interesting concept. Um, you know, rank choice um, voting as, you know, kind of the standard kind for, and the kind that Mr. Bosworth, you've been working on and you've spoken to us about this in the past. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, those are things that we, I think we ought to be talking about as well, not here today, um, but you know, if, if we really want to address issues about representation and access, there's all we know there are all kinds of other things that ought to be discussed. Just wanted to say that and um, put that in uh, the parking lot for the moment as well. Um, I could go on and on, and I'm not gonna. Um, but I, um, I do actually, in, in the interest of moving us forward and trying to clarify a little bit, you know, where what's happening here and, you know, what I think would be really helpful for this council in order to make, um, you know, informed decisions, a motion, and Bonnie, I sent it to you. I saw that you got it. So I'd like to, I'm, I'm going to make a motion right now. I know it's straight out of the gate, but if I don't do it now, um, I may miss my chance. So um, there it is. Um, can you all see that, hopefully? Yep. So, um, I, so my motion is to direct our interim city manager to um, provide the following material at the next public meeting scheduled to consider district elections. Um, I think that the California Voting Rights Act ought to be included in our packet. Um, and it should be made available to the public. I know it's public information, but that should be there. Um, any available updates on the California Supreme Court's timeline for hearing the Pico Neighborhood Association at Al versus the Santa Monica case? Um, I've included here, although Kathy, you may have um, already sort of you know, address this one. Um, the opinion of the U.S. Supreme Court case, Shaw versus Reno, this is, uh, this refers back to um, one of our first speakers mentioning, uh, you know, federal rules around gerrymandering districts. Um, and I guess maybe you've looked at that and, you know, the demographer has. So if it doesn't seem relevant, we could delete it. But also the full 2020 census tract data and map for the city. I think that should all be included in our um, in our packet for the next meeting. Um, and two, express the intention of the city council to consider rescinding the district elections resolution at the end of this public. That's merited, or if we feel that that's merited based on evidence received during this process. I say that because I do feel like um, this is a big open question in our community. 
And I'd like to, um, you know, include the possibility of that, 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 you know, we may, we may do that depending on what we find out. There's my motion and um, look forward to discussion. Thank you, council member. Uh, Justin, uh, sorry, council member Cummings. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and start by seconding the motion so we can have that discussion. Um, but did want to follow up on some comments. Um, the one about representation, that was a great question. Um, this has come up. I've had a number of members of the community um, reach out to me asking, you know, along with these questions around direct black mayor and, and um, grand choice voting. Uh, but some people have been asking, you know, what do we have to have the seven representatives and um, could it be five? Could it be six with a direct elect like mayor? Should we have two representatives for each district uh, rather than just one? And so, you know, I guess the answer that I have is that um, these are still questions that are up in the air and that if members of the public want to weigh in these community forums and also writing to the city council and letting, you know, providing your comments um, in the public comment um, areas, that's the best way to get that information out so that we can kind of track what people are saying in terms of what they want to see the city council look like moving forward. Because if we go in the direction of district elections, this is the time when um, the members of the public will have the opportunity to kind of weigh in on what our, the composition of our city looks like. But I did have a question about, you know, what it takes to demonstrate a violation of the C the California Voter Rights Act. Um, just looking at the, the language in section 14041, um, subsection B says the occurrence of a racially polarized voting shall from examining results of elections in which at least one candidate is a member of a protected class. And I think here what's been argued is that um, you know, there's the basis of um, there not being Latino representation on the city council, but we can prove that in fact, when Latinos have ran in this town, in this community, um, especially within the last 10 years, that they have not only, but we have, have actually seen one um, Latino former mayor, David Terrazas, you know, become be the highest vote recipient and become the mayor of Santa Cruz. And so, um, you know, there's this question of when, and then in addition to that, there are um, elections when Latinos have not ran, right? And so, um, if someone doesn't run, and then we can't say that there's um, biased voting on behalf of Latinos, when in fact, since no Latino ran, they can't actually be elected. Uh, but what we do see is that when um, people from underrepresented groups and when people from protected classes run, overwhelmingly, they get elected onto the city council. And so it's difficult for me to understand, you know, how um, in our situation, you know, we would lose this argument when in fact we've, we had a history of not only electing Latinos, but um, overwhelmingly electing those who were the highest vote getters, and then also electing other people from protected classes. Um, so, and I think one of the things that I noticed in the maps and what we saw today is that while in the beach flats, it might be easier for a Latino to get elected, it seemed like in the rest of the city, that would actually be diluted in those areas where we wouldn't see Latinos having a higher chance of getting elected. So, you know, if the intention of the law is that we're trying to eliminate bias and reduce bias in terms of who gets elected, you know, it seems like passing this would actually increase the potential for bias in our elections and in our voting system. So I'm concerned with that. And I know that there's a number of people in the community who um, think that this might be a frivolous lawsuit and that we should actually you know, counter sue on the basis of it being a frivolous lawsuit. And, you know, maybe that would actually um, make the um, the people who are trying to sue it think twice if, in fact, you know, if they're unable to prove we have bias voting in Santa Cruz, that they would then have to pay us, you know, the equivalent of what they're trying to charge us in attorney's fees. So, um, you know, and, and to Council Member Brown's point, you know, these this is obviously problematic when we have a group that's literally going throughout the state of extorting money out of communities and abusing, you know, um, the, the California Voters' Rights Act. And so, um, you know, what direction we're going in, but I think that, you know, if it turns out that we have a strong case um, and that you know, the, the individuals don't have what it takes to demonstrate the violence. 
violation of the California Voting Rights Act, um, you know, I think that we should keep in mind the opportunity to not go in this direction or at a minimum take it to the community and let them vote on it. Because, you know, if the community wants to go down this route of district election, put something on the ballot and let them vote on it. But, um, you know, I guess, you know, for that, I'll just repose that question and maybe somebody can answer what it takes to demonstrate a violation of the act and then kind of some of my comments, but it doesn't seem clear that, that they would have a good case and that we would be able to defend ourselves. Thank you, I think, I think yeah, I was going to say, go ahead. Council. Um, I think, I mean, Council Member uh, Cummings did uh, correctly quote the standards that are applicable in the statute, but rather than go by the piece by piece analysis of the demographic uh, census and whether or not, you know, we meet that standard, I would just refer to the track record of cities and special districts throughout California, which is dismal. And, um, you know, in attempting to defend against these uh, California Voting Rights Act uh, challenges. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think I, I hear the arguments that are being, being made. And as someone who lives here in Santa Cruz and you know, who knows the city pretty well, um, you know, I think those arguments sound compelling, except when you compare the Santa Cruz situation to virtually every other city in California that has attempted to, to, to fend off uh, this type of a legal challenge. Um, and it didn't occur to me at the time, but I just want to, in, in reference to Council Member Brown's comment, but um, I thought- Tony, I, did, Tony can I, did you, um, can you turn your volume up a little bit? You're pretty gravelly, you're hard to hear. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, there you go, that's a little better. Yeah. I, I was saying that, um, you know, at, just at the gut level, it seems like it's a voting rights challenge in Santa Cruz uh, doesn't make sense, except when you consider that in comparison to, you know, virtually every other city in, in California that has had to try to defend themselves against these lawsuits. And so, um, in, including the, the city of Santa Monica, uh, which lost its case in the trial court, and um, and I'm not, I'm certainly not uh, a, a a mind reader or a player. Um, the fact that there really is not a divergence of opinion in the appellate courts in California, and the Supreme Court accepted review of the case, did not bode well um, necessarily for the city of Santa Monica in that case. That's not to say that the, that the Supreme Court might not agree with the Court of Appeal, um, but generally they take up cases when there's a split of authority uh, in in um, the different appellate districts uh, to resolve those types of differences. And then um, it just occurred to me that I've, I've certainly been familiar with anecdotal uh, evidence of people actually moving into districts in order to run for a seat. And so, you know, I think that the uh, the rule agency has makes some sense in the in in the sense that it's, you're less likely to have a situation where some carpetbagger moves into what is perceived as a weak district in order to try to get on the city council, but doesn't really represent that district. So that's just a thought on that. Um, I don't know if I covered your other uh, question, uh, Council Member Cummings. I think it was along the lines of you know, what does it take to demonstrate a violation of the, the California Voter Rights Act? Yeah, and I'm just I'm just not prepared to go through the data and 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 do that analysis under the standards that are contained in the statute. So, so I guess I fell back on sort of the track record uh, argument. And many other communities in uh, California are similar demographically to the city of Santa Cruz. And so, um, you know, none of them have succeeded on that basis uh, thus far. And I think the likelihood of prevailing on a claim that the lawsuit is frivolous, given, again, the dismal track record that, um, that other cities have experienced when challenged under the CBRA, you know, not, a, a court is just not going to find that a CBRA lawsuit is frivolous. Thanks, Tony. 
Um, uh, Bonnie, you have a question for council member, um, council member um, Brown about yeah. her motion. You wanna clarify something, then I'll move on to council member Watkins and then council member Collintari Johnson. Thank you. I just wanted to confirm because you did mention that at the next public meeting, you wanted all of those things included in the agenda packet, but the next public meeting, as far as I know, is not a Brown acted, it is a public meeting, but it's not a Brown acted meeting that would have an agenda packet with materials. So are you wanting those for that meeting on the 18th or those for the next council meeting it comes to? For the next Brown acted meeting, thank, thank you. Got it, Bonnie. okay. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Um, yeah, no, I, I appreciate the clarification and the questions. And I think at, at the end of it all, it's obviously very complicated and I don't think there's really a perfect solution, right? And so I understand the challenges associated with the at-large, um, associated with the districts for all that have been brought up. And, um, you know, hopefully, if we do need to move to districts and that's where we end up, then um, you know one of the potential benefits of having more minority representation is the opportunity for them to be able to campaign in a smaller district, which has been proven a barrier for fundraising, et cetera, um, for some other folks. So I think there will be you know pros cons you know. Uh, trade-offs along the way, and we're kind of just trying to factor how to do that the best of our ability within the constraints that we're under um, legally and otherwise, as, as well as also very transparent in terms of how we're engaging our community and hearing their voices in this process. Um, which gets to my question, is in regards to kind of people being able to access um, or having their voices heard, how are we reaching um, other populations that might not feel inclined to participate in coming to an, a virtual meeting like this right now, um, but more so in terms of um, whether it be, you know, translated or in other ways to kind of access their input um, from the community. I see Ralph, you popped in, feel free to. Yeah, we're um, translating a lot of the material we're sending out to the um, um, community, including on our website and social media and all that, and we're making sure that there's translators available at these meetings. Um, we have a vote uh, for September 18 um, on a Saturday morning, also make sure that people who are working Monday through Fridays um, have an opportunity to participate as well. And um, we'll be sure to, um, you know, reach out to, um, do a better job of reaching out for that meeting as well. There's always room to improve when you're doing community outreach and, and all of that. So, um, but we'll be sure to um, um, really focus in on, um, especially it sounds like in the Beach Flats area and um, any other neighborhoods or community groups, um, council members would like us to um, spend a little more time doing outreach too. We can um, spend more time doing that as well. Great, thanks, Ralph. Yeah, I think what I'll do is forward you sort of suggested um, demographics. I think there's the ELACs at the schools, there's a number of other um, university bridges down at the beach flats, the university, et cetera. But I think we do wanna have as much of an inclusive process as possible to ensure that we're hearing all voices of the community and, and their input as we move um, forward with this process. So I appreciate your input and I, um, I'm happy to hear it on a Saturday morning, which hopefully we'll get some other folks there. Okay. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Contar Johnson and then Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. Um, I, want, I want to thank Council Members Brown and Cummings and Watkins for your comments. Um, I have more questions than comments. I, I also share the concern about diluting the diversity on our city council and in our leadership. Um, I was also curious about our um, outreach and participation efforts and, and and um, one suggestion is to our committees and commissions and um, ask them to do outreach to their communities because they're they're serving as advisories to our city council. So that's another opportunity. So my questions, um, uh, I'll just I'll just say them all at once. Um, so th this is this is something that Councilmember Brown brought up in her motion about the intention of rescinding 
Um, and I guess, I don't know who this question goes to, maybe it's Tony, but um, would we be able to rescind the resolution at any point? Um, I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand the process um, and to the point of the caller and what Councilmember Brown brought up, the, of, is this a done deal? I mean, could, could we rescind to the council at any point? Do we, do we need to have that um, language in a motion? So that's one of my questions. Um, and then my other clarifying question is, um, we have to go to the voters for, for them, for the charter amendments is how I understand it. And so if voters vote that they don't approve the charter amendment to go to district elections, what, what does that scenario look like? And, um, and then, and Council Member Cummings, um, uh, ask, you know, can we take it to the voters? So what, what's that distinction between um, the voters voting on a charter amendment and then taking it to the voters and have other communities done that? I know there's a lot of questions, but I'm just gonna get it all out there. And then um, we talked to Watsonville. I know they're clearly a very different um, community. Their makeup is very different, but they went through this um, not too far in our history. So they, they went through this as well. So we connected with them to ask about um, their lessons learned as they went through districting process. So those were a lot of questions. <laughs> um, so it sounded like the first one was around what happens if the voters don't approve the charter amendment is, can we kick that one off? Yeah, let's, let's list them that. Yeah. So I, I understood the first question as, is this a done deal? Um, and I'm going to defer to Cassie on. Um, I would say no, it's not a done deal. Um, at the end of the day, the council needs to pass an ordinance uh, to district elections. And so the council could just choose to not pass that ordinance and to not finalize the process. Uh, so that's an option that's open to the council, uh, regardless of whatever motions are made today. Uh, I think that was your first question. Uh, the second question I believe was to the charter, a uh, potential charter amendment. And just to sort of fill everyone in, I know there have been discussions about a potential charter amendment. To convert to district elections, we do not have to amend our charter. We could just leave it requiring at-large elections and just have that inconsistency. Um, we could come back later and clean it up just to make it consistent and, and to what the process we really what the process we really have is. Or there, you know, there are a myriad of options for a charter and for a charter amendment. We could change our charter to convert to a directly elected mayor. I know that's something that's um, of interest to a lot of community members. Or just, there are just a myriad of ways to amend uh, the charter. Um, so, you know, if we did, it would be, you know, I think your question is, well, what if we put a charter amendment on going to districts and then that didn't pass. Um, I think that's where the issue of, um, you know, the California Voting Rights Act versus the charter comes into play. And that's why we don't really need to amend our charter at all to be able to convert to districts. Yeah, that, that was my misunderstanding. So thanks for clarifying that. Um, and I think just the last one, it's a general question. Maybe Ralph can answer. Um, have we connected with Watsonville to learn about their process? You know, um, yes and no. I know um, Bonnie, um, uh, our, our city clerk, has been in touch with them to kind of figure out um, translation services and all that stuff and understand that they went through this process as well. Um, so, uh, you know, we could definitely talk to them more about, you know, what they experienced and um, some maybe lessons learned from, from their process as well. Um, but yeah. Uh, and, and I would just add on that, um, Certainly the lessons learned in, in kind of managing to the earlier point about how the council members relate to residents and all that, Watsonville has tons of lessons learned that they could probably share. I would note in terms of making the transition, they made it as part of a lawsuit and a court ordered a district map. So it just, it's just worth noting that when they drew districts, it, um, it wasn't this kind of community drawn process. It was all in a courtroom. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that makes it different. Yeah. Um, I, 
I'm sorry, I did have one other, I'm looking at my list of questions that I wrote up, um, that have other communities voted on district elections here in, um, in California, rather than doing it by ordinance um, through uh, council, have other communities voted on it? This was actually one of the problems is that in, when the law, when the California Voting Rights Act first took, uh, kicked in, uh, cities had to take a vote. They didn't have the option to do it by ordinance. Mm. And so Visalia and a number of other cities put it to voters and the voters turned it down and they were all immediately sued. Um, well, not all, but, but almost all of them were immediately sued and then had to um, agree to, you know, they all quickly settled. The first, back then it was six figure settlements and had a judge order them into districts. So that's why the state legislature, at the request of League of Cities, created this avenue to say, okay, when even if they didn't have polarized voting beforehand, the vote on district elections was turning out to be polarized. And so that vote created the evidence that then forced them into districts, generally with you know high six figure paid. So that's why the, the state set up this process to do it by ordinance without having to put it to vote. Because even if you didn't have polarized voting before, that one election could be the proof that the plaintiffs need, and then you end up having a judge do it anyways. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Next will be Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, let's see, I had a few comments and questions as well. Um, and some of the questions have been answered around community access, our next meetings in September, I think it's September 18th, January, February, and March. Um, but after today and hearing the, the input and comments we have received and emails, um, what, how will that be incorporated into next steps? That's my first question. Well, do you wanna? Take that, or I don't know if it's uh, Doug or you. Um. Up until the tail end of the question, um, Vice Mayor, I was, um, our website um, will con we'll continue to have um, up-to-date information um, for uh, the public, and um, they, it includes my contact information too, so if there are any questions that come up between now and our next meeting, um, they could send those over to me, and um, I'm going to be sort of the funnel between um, the community and um, our our staff here and our team here who can help respond to those questions. And of course, we'll get all that feedback to to Doug and NBC as well to help um, draft these initial maps. And the questions that have um, that are even questioning the process and questioning um, there were a lot of there would be a Q&A available on that website, uh, on the city website. Is there a special page for that? For districts regarding district elections to point people to? Yes. Fact, yeah, there is a fact section on the website right now, but can we add to those, Ross? Yes, and um, it's gonna be a living document, a living website. So um, as we get new questions, um, we'll work on answering them and um, getting them on there. Okay. And, um, you know, one of the callers asked about options that were, um, so this resolution was uh, last year prior to uh, myself being on council. And so I'm not sure of the um, discussion and the information that went in and led up to that point. Um, last year, so I think it would also be helpful to have um, any of the options that were discussed and that are available and were available at the time that to include that information, um, if that's possible. And I, I, I guess that would be for Ralph as well. <laughs> um, and maybe it's already there. I haven't seen the web page, so I'm sorry if I'm maybe bringing something up that already exists. 
but it, it, it's just clear with this community input, there are a lot of questions um, around process and even here on the council, um, you know, asking if it's a done deal and what the options are and what options have been explored and how we move forward um, in a community process um, that really addresses, you know, all the questions, the diluting of diversity, renters, um, and, uh, you know, if voters don't approve, do we stick with seven districts simply because then we don't have to amend a city charter? Do we consider other things? Uh, you know, there's so many moving components that um, it would would be nice to understand how we gather all that and move forward into those next steps um, to have all that answered. And um, they, all my questions have been pretty much answered. Um, the process, the, the city charter, um, and I, uh, outreach participation. And then I think there was um, one question I had for legal. Um, what is the deadline again we have for this? There was someone who had um, suggested we wait for a Supreme Court decision. But my understanding is we're, there's a timeline on this legal uh, litigation part. And so what what in order, uh, well, first of all, the, the resolution um, uh, that the council adopted is expressing the intention of transitioning to district elections by November of 2022. In order to do that, we really need to have the district boundaries drawn up and transmitted to the county elections official um, by sometime in early April. Um, that probably has a specific date. It's April 17th, yes. <laughs> a day that looms large in my mind. <laughs> and is there wiggle room to change that? Um, we could, um, you know, uh, negotiate an, an amendment to the agreement, but um, but in terms of the red, uh, the county elections officials deadline, those are pretty hard and fast. And Kathy has more familiarity with the status of the PICO all I can say is I'm watching it closely and uh, the council will be, will be the first to know if when there's a decision on that case. Yeah, and, and I can say one of the attorneys from Santa Monica actually said at the earliest he expects a ruling at the very earliest in March and much more likely after that. So you really, saying with this, the registrar deadline, you, you don't have time to wait for that ruling and then go through the districting process. But as has been mentioned, uh, you can go through districts and then you know, rescind that ordinance <laughs> before, the, before the election. You have to have them drawn by April, but you really have until July to rescind that ordinance if you change your mind. Can we those options written down? <laughs> As part of that information, that would be very helpful. Just, just for the public, um, Ralph. Just, just, and also for council members, the the web page is available um, on. And I, I don't know, Ralph, if there's a way to. It's a little bit hard to find. I, I just am looking at it now. Um, somehow call it out a little bit strong, more strongly. It does have frequently asked questions, and then it also has the timeline of the city and council action um, all the way through um, basically the March uh, 2022. Uh, so, yeah, and the timeline to, um, I think has brought confusion because the timeline is stated in a way that this is a done deal, this is what's happening, right? And so that's where there's a little uncertainty um, and so just having all the information spelled out, um, I think is important. Um, and even in the agenda report, it says next steps. 
um, as if this is the only option word. And um, so I think just understanding for the public, especially if we're having public hearings, to understand the big picture as well as all the paths forward. Each path has a consequence, right? And um, what are each of those paths and what are those consequences? Okay. Is there any other, uh, I've got Council Member Brown and then I'm probably gonna chew myself in here. I'm, I am closing, it, cl public comment is closed by the way. Um, I see Mr. Bosworth has had his hand up, but I, I did close public comment. Um, so I'll go ahead to, um, I'm just gonna queue myself up real quick here and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Council Member Brown. Um, yeah, I'm supportive of, support the motion this evening. I think that, um, you know, again, whether or not this is a done deal is a little bit of an unknown based on uh, a lot of the moving pieces, including, you know, really important uh, court, court, uh, court results in some of these cases. Um, but I think it's also clear, I think it's also important for the public to, to understand that we did adopt a resolution um, and we have in a sense settled the legal, you know, we've settled a, a, a court, a, basically we have a legal settlement that is moving us in this direction. Now, whether or not we end up there ultimately, I guess can be up for, just, it, it can be potentially changed towards as other things come into play. Um, I was on the council when the, that resolution was drawn up. And one of the primary factors I think um, with that resolution was, was the, um, was the threat really to, you know, it, it was very clear that the city, a city of the, the size of Santa Cruz could, could not uphold that kind of legal, um, legal kind of uh, process of trying to, you know, appeal this and, and work through a legal um, framework of trying to undo this requirement. Um, we actually looked at a number of cities that were doing their um, lawsuits at that time, some of which have now just folded up and, and stopped because um, they were literally out of money um, to, to, to pursue those cases. So it, that was certainly one of the main, you know, one of the primary reasons that there was, a re that resolution was passed was a recognition that um, you know, we, that the law is, is very clear and that, you know, I agree, it's, it's terrible to have a law firm running around California making communities do this. It's obvious any community, any elected official would want um, is to be forced into something that your community, first of all, really doesn't understand and really um, also, you know, may or may not support I think what's most important about what we're doing now is we're starting that public discussion. And I do think um, that's the most important thing. And I wanna recognize, you know, Ralph's uh, ability, you know, his commitment to trying to and get the word out as much as possible. I'm hoping maybe some of the press on the listening in tonight will do, will do um, some good reporting on what we're embarking on. Um, and we've, you know, we, due to COVID and other issues, we maybe should have started earlier on all of this, but the fact of the matter is, is we're here where we are. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in understanding from the public where, where their thoughts are on this. Um, we have, I think, three more public hearings. Um, I'm hoping we might be able to squeeze in more if we can. Um, it's awful to do this on Zoom, which is really, really frustrating to me that people are not gonna be able to like physically come and look at these maps, but um, we've gotta figure out a way to accommodate people to the extent that we can. And I do think some direct outreach to, um, to uh, Beach Flats neighborhood is really important as well. So they understand um, what's, what's available as well. So, um, you know, some of the speakers had asked um, for us to, you know, give our remarks right now in terms of whether we support this or not. And, I, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be one of the ones that says, let's do our public process and learn as we go. I think this is a process that we're learning from. And um, I wanna allow ourselves the time to do that and um, provide that as much as possible. And um, you know, I, wish, I wish we had gotten started when, when, you know, in May of last year, but we didn't. 
Um, and so we've missed a lot of opportunity with our community to actually have these conversations by not having any of this brought forward. Um, and I don't, I'm not quite sure why that happened, but it did, didn't show up. And so we're, we're starting and, and it does feel rushed and it would have been nice to have more time to talk to people certainly about these items. Um, but we're certainly embarking on it now and we will be working hard to get the word out. Um, and I guess it finally, um, I think, um, you know, this gives folks a chance to also learn about, you know, uh, again, we only get about a little over 60% of our population votes for the city council. So there's still a lot of people out there who are not engaging in our democracy locally. So I also think of this as a way to potentially, again, engage with people more. Um, it could be a way where people are seeing maybe an avenue into having their voice heard or an avenue of not having their heard. Um, but I think anytime you talk about your democracy at a local level, it, it's a, a value. So I, I want to keep that in mind as well. You know, we're still, we, we still have pretty low voter turnout for our city council. And I think it's, um, it's important for people to really understand what, what, what this could shape for the future. So those are my comments this evening. And I just want to make sure people are up to date. Our next meeting will be on September 18th, and we'll be sure to put that uh, time. I believe Ralph has scheduled for a 7 p.m. Or no, I'm sorry, that's the Saturday meeting. Are we doing that at 10, Ralph, or what time does that meeting start? Yes, um, it's scheduled for 10 a.m. Saturday. Okay. And um, I'll turn it over to Council Member Brown and then Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Now I have a random thoughts and responses. I'm gonna to try to keep them organized and uh, short. Um, so I wanna thank, uh, you know, uh, all of my colleagues on the council for your comments. I think, you know, what folks have heard, if you're listening in, is that um, this, we very much are trying to muddle through this and it's, it's, there's a lot of unknowns and um, we do wanna hear from you and, and create the space and I appreciate hearing that from everybody. Um, and I also want, I neglected to thank uh, um, Ralph Demerica, um on our staff who has taken on this um, challenging uh, job of <laughs> coordinating something that's really nebulous and, um, you know, um, you know, just experimental, I guess, from, you know, at our end. Uh, for all of your, I, I in no way want to suggest that like having not talked about this or community not knowing has anything to do with your efforts. You um, you're really are committed. I just want to shout out and say that for the first time in my time on the council, um, where I've talked about we need more community engagement, we need community engagement, um, a staff called me up and said, I heard you and I really want to talk to you about what that looks like to you and get your suggestions. And Ralph, you did that and I really appreciate it. And I think you did that with other council members. Um, it, it, really, it really is um, you know, a, a collaborative effort. So two um, points. One, in just following up on Vice Mayor Bruner's uh, questions around the process to date and kind of what information has been gathered. Um, I just wanted to um, put out there that we did have a charter review committee uh, and the intention was for that group, um, uh, you know, uh, appointed folks from the community to um, really look at a range of potential reforms, um, all of which with the exception of just district elections with seven council members would require charter amendment you know, charter amendments that have to go to the voters. So there's probably some documents about that, you know, information gathering that they did, it, their work was really cut short, but if it's possible to find those, I guess this is more, mostly um, Ralph to you and folks in the city manager's office, if that is around, um, it could be cool to get access, uh, maybe link it to the web page or something like that. Um, because it has some other, you know, I, I looked at it at the time and I forgot exactly what's in there, but it's interesting. Um, and then uh, Mayor Myers, your point about um, the, you know, kind of lamenting that this is all virtual and it is, a, it's a total bummer. Um, but maybe um, at a certain point, 
when we get some maps, weather permitting, we could do, depending on what's happening, like an outdoor outside thing where, you know, people can be out distanced and, um, and actually be able to go around and check, you know, look at stuff. Um, so, you know, there, there may be ways, even in this really constrained realm of possibility that we're in. Um, so uh, I think I'll leave it there. And I, or I guess I'll just add for the, with respect to the um, motion that I made, um, just so I don't, to make it clear, I'm not doing this to ask for busy work from staff. If you want to take out the Reno, um, the, the piece on uh, the federal case around gerrymandering, I think that um, having thought about it, Kathy, your response is pretty clear there. So no need, I mean, for my, so unless others want to keep. Um, and just really making it clear that the motion I is really just intended to help clarify for the public, you know, what, where we're at, not that, you know, not to stop work on anything, not to try to introduce a whole bunch of new ideas, but really to just carry on with this process with an understanding that things may change or new things may arise. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Cummings? Just have one quick question because I know folks want to keep going. I think we're pretty close to being done with our conversation this evening. But I did want to um, follow up on a comment that the mayor made. Um, and just for the public, I think, because I was thinking about this process and, and you know, why we are, we're at the point we are. And I just remembered that um, one of the things I think we were hoping to incorporate into this was the new census data, and it took so long for that data to come out that in order for us to be able to draw the maps appropriately with that new information, we pretty much had to wait, and um, unfortunately, it's caused this substantial delay in our ability to kind of move this process along. So just thought I'd share that with members of the public to give some clarification on this process a little bit more quickly. Thank you, council member. Okay, um, I think this will wrap up our, uh, and so we have a motion on the table. Um, and we also have, um, council member Brown, we had a request, um, a recommendation also, if you would be willing to add to this motion um, that we adopt the new uh, timeline that uh, Ralph uh, described. So do you mind if we add that in as the third item on your motion and that way we'll get it all done? Absolutely, that's great. And while you're in there, um, Bonnie, if you wanna take out the Shaw versus Reno bullet, it's the third bullet down. It's fascinating, but I think we're beyond that at this point. Okay. And Ralph, um, I may, I'm wondering maybe too if we could post, um, I see we have the resolution and also the contract we have with Doug's, um, uh, Doug's consulting firm. Maybe we can put the copy of the Voting Rights Act up on the website as well right now. It's a web page that way we could, that way people who are listening can dig in. Um, okay, uh, we have a motion on by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Cummings. And um, Bonnie, we can go ahead and do a roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Watkins? Aye. Calantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Council Member Golder is absent. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Gotta get to my script here. Um, we'll check. Okay, um, so please everybody in the public um, look for the information for our meeting on September 18th at 10 a.m. And also we will have two additional public hearings and um, those will be posted on the website. I just want to thank everyone from the public for attending this evening, and this meeting is now adjourned. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Goodbye.